So I want to ask you all a question. It's a very simple question. Can you categorize the people you know, your acquaintances, friends, relatives? Can you categorize them into good and bad? Can you box them up into good and bad? Okay, the answer I'm getting is no, but life is a binary. That's what religion tells you. It's a battle between good and evil. Most religions will tell you that life is a battle between good and evil. Good always wins, so be on the good side, right? This is what most religions tell you. But if you plumb the depths of religious theology of most religions, you will realize that good and evil are not opposing forces. They coexist. They are two sides of the same coin. Yeah? Now, I'm here to talk about the Ramayanam, which is mythology with some historical perspective. And mythology is as far removed from reality as is humanly possible. You have flying elephants, flying uh, chariots. It's as far removed from mythology as humanly possible. So that is not the case with Kamban's poem. Kamban's Ramayanam, although it is mythology, it's rooted in realism. He talks about Ayodhya which is actually utopia. It's an Ayodhya where milk flows in the rivers instead of water. It's an Ayodhya where there are no takers and so there are no givers. There are no beggars. Everybody is self-sufficient. So there is no scope for dhanam and dharmam. It's an Ayodhya where the king is both father and son to his subjects. Now is this utopic Ayodhya possible? Not really. That's a figment of Kamban's imagination. But when you come to Kamban's characterizations, he gives his characters shades upon shades of emotional overtones, layers upon layers of personality traits. He makes them complex individuals, just like you and me. So the answer you gave me, can you box your acquaintances into good and bad? Your answer was no. The same way, you cannot box Kamban's characters into good and bad. That is true of nature also. Think of the five elements of nature, earth, air, uh, wind, fire, water, and space, right? Now these five elements, earth can be washed away, washed away by water, wind douses fire, fire burns up air. These five elements, have it in their nature to oppose each other and destroy each other. But it, when it comes to this beautiful universe we live in, these five opposing elements exist in perfect harmony. That's the same thing about us as well. We are composed of the three gunas. You know about the three gunas, Rajasam, Satvikam and Tamasam. Rajasam makes us aggressive, makes us ambitious, makes us want to achieve. Tamasam makes us dull and lazy and evil. Satvikam makes us pure and good. And we have all three of the guna in, gunas in us operating all the time. The permutation and combination differs and that is how we define ourselves as doing good things or doing bad things. You can't ever categorize a person into a good person or a bad person. All you can say is a person who has done a good thing He's a person who has done a bad thing. Because we have it in our nature to do all of these things. So Kamban's characters, you uh, take Kaikeyi for example. She is the reason Rama went to the forest. Right? You would think that she could easily be dubbed the villainous of the piece. But in the very beginning of the epic, when Kuni goes to Kaikeyi to tell her that uh, Rama is going to become king, there's a difference between Valmiki and Kamban. In uh, uh, Valmiki, Rama is about to be crowned as a crown prince. In Kamban, Rama is about to be crowned as king. So when Kuni goes to tell him, tell uh, Kaikeyi that Rama is going to be crowned king, she begins by saying, Kaikeyi, you have a big problem. And Kaikeyi says, what problem can I have? I am the woman who gave birth to Rama. 
she says ramane petra yarku idarundo i am his biological mother what can go wrong in my life you know in a few minutes she goes to dasaratha few minutes you know of conversation with kuni later she goes to dasaratha and says i want you to banish sita's husband to the forest so her son rama has become sita's husband rama that is how kaikeyi transforms so you could say that good apple gone bad so kaikeyi is bad not really right at the very end of the epic after the rama ravana yuddha after sita's agni parichay the same kaikeyi is referred to as devam by rama so rama dasaratha comes to meet rama from the heavens and dasaratha says my son i want to bless you with two boons ask what you want and rama says you disowned kaikeyi and you disowned barada the boons i want is i want you to accept kaikeyi as your wife and barada as your son and the way rama puts it across to dasaratha is he says yen devam kaikeyi i want her to become your wife again her son barada i want him to become your son again because rama has no right to say my mother and my brother dasaratha disowned them the moment dasaratha disowned them kaikeyi stopped being his mother and barada stopped being his brother so how will he refer to kaikeyi he refers to her as my god and there's a reason for rama doing that you see rama looked forward to a life of sainthood rama was not enamored by the kingdom rama was not enamored by earthly powers when dasaratha told him rama i am going to crown you king kamban says he accepted it because it was his duty and when kaikeyi told him the very next day rama go to the forest kamban says his face blossomed like a thousand lotuses he was so happy to go to the forest so that was one reason why uh, rama thought that kaikeyi is the woman who gave me what i actually wanted the second reason is for 14 years after rama leaves to the forest kaikeyi doesn't open her mouth she is in kashta mauna people talk around her they berate her they abuse her verbally barada abuses her vasishta abuses her lakshmana abuses her she listens to all that and doesn't say a word that was her penance that was her prayachitam so she is atoned for her sin and rama calls her devam so kaikeyi is not bad okay let's go to kuni kuni is the one who made kaikeyi do all this she is the you know the sole reason behind all this is she bad kamban says not really kamban says not really vidhi made kuni do what she did and that vidhi is guided by the boon that indra got from lord vishnu indra prayed to lord vishnu that the asura should be destroyed and lord vishnu promised to come as rama that boon came in the form of destiny and pushed kuni to do what she did so not even kuni is evil now let's come to the main protagonist of the story ravana you would imagine that ravana is all bad that's how it is in the valmiki ramayana ravana is the epitome of evil in the valmiki ramayana but in kamban's ramayana he is like one of us governed by the three gunas when kamban introduces ravana it is in the aranya kandam when uh, just before surpanaga comes to lanka ravana is seated on the throne of victory he has conquered the three worlds he has conquered all the devas he has conquered the three gods of brahma vishnu and shiva he has conquered them and ravana has also conquered lust is a very important point that kamban makes you see lust and anger are part of our psyche without lust we can't procreate without anger we won't have any self defense mechanism no self preservation mechanism so lust and anger can only be controlled can't be eliminated the saints and rishis and munis strived for that vishwamitra was a huge saga of hundreds of years of trying and finally he succeeded ravana had already achieved what vishwamitra was trying to do ravana had controlled his lust he was surrounded by nubile young women and yet he was not bothered and the uh, song i know a lot of you don't speak tamil but kamban's not just the words but the intonation the cadence and the rhythm of the poetry speaks to you so i'm going to say it in tamil kamban says puli nadal udayanum ponnadai punaindanum poovinanum that refers to the trinity of gods 
நலியும் வளர்த்தார் அல்லர் தேவர்களில் இங்கே இனி யார் நாட்ட வல்லார் ராவணாஸ் டிஃபீட்டட் த ட்ரினிட்டி ஆஃப் காட்ஸ் ராவணாஸ் டிஃபீட்டட் த தேவாஸ் மெலியுமிடை தடிக்கும் முலை வேயிலந்தோல் சேயரிக்கன் வென்றி மாதர் வலிய நெடும் புலவியிலும் வயங்காத மகுட நிறை வயங்க மன்னோ வாட் ஹீ சேங் இஸ் தீஸ் அப்சராஸ் ஹூ ஆர் சரவுண்டிங் ராவணா ஆர் தி எப்பிடோம் ஆஃப் பியூட்டி தே ஆர் ஸ்டண்டிங் விமன் who are available to ravana at a time when he needs them all men need women at a certain point in time but even at that time ravana ignored these women because he had conquered lust this is the ravana the peak of rajasam that surpanaga comes to see surpanaga comes running to ravana face drenched in blood nose and ears having been chopped off and ravana is distraught to see his sister his first question is yavar sayal who did this to you and then she tells a long story about rama and lakshmana and ravana still has the presence of mind to ask surpanaga why did they do this to you what did you do to deserve this and then surpanaga starts to talk about sita she says i am not the person responsible for this there is another woman her name is sita and he describes she describes sita's beauty so eloquently again I'll, i'll say the song to you she says tholaye sollugeno sudarmugattu ulavum baalaye sollugeno allave ivaluthuveno meelavum thegeippadu allal thani thani vilambalaatren naalaye kaandi endre yaani ni uraippadenne i can't talk any more she says i can't describe the beauty of her shoulders her eyes her face if you want you go see for yourself but ravana go tomorrow she won't be there for long and ravana falls in love with this image of a woman whom he has not seen and again so is surpanaga the villainous of the piece kamban says no kamban says at some point in time ravana inadvertently killed surpanaga's husband in battle so she had that vengeance in her heart and she saw the perfect opportunity to destroy two enemies rama and ravana when her nose and ears were cut off she went to her brothers karan and dushan in the forest and they went to fight with rama but in 3 hours in just 3 hours rama destroyed 14000 asuras and karan and dushan so she had seen the power of rama if anybody could destroy ravana it was rama so her goal was to set rama against ravana if rama wins she will get rama so she had a vested interest and she was a woman who was grieving for her husband who wanted to wreak vengeance on the man who killed her husband so is she bad not really so coming back to ravana he rushes to the forest and seeks marichan's help in uh, acquiring sita the moment ravana tells marichan that this is rama's wife marichan shuts his ears and says chichi kamban uses those very words marichan says you are dead from now on you are from this minute onwards you are a dead man walking you want to abduct rama's wife i am hiding in the forest i was a asura i have now become a sage because of rama he killed my mother he killed my brother i saw how he vanquished them i am afraid of him that's why i am hiding in the forest and you want to fight with this rama uh, with this rama he says ravana don't you will be destroyed your whole race will be destroyed ravana doesn't listen he goes to the forest he abducts sita sita wants ravana she says ravana you don't know my husband you're playing with fire he has taken a vow to destroy the asuras don't poke a elephant who is already mad would you poke a mad elephant with a spear don't do that don't provoke him ravana doesn't listen then jadayu comes to stop ravana and jadayu says ravana all you have done so far all the penance you have done all the boons you have got everything will be destroyed in one fell sweep by rama don't do this he doesn't listen he takes sita and imprisons her in the ashokavanam in lanka and anuman comes searching for sita anuman is captured and taken to ravana's throne room and uh, there anuman advises ravana he says this is no one this is not an ordinary human being this is god he has come here to destroy you don't fight with him ravana doesn't listen and finally anuman sets fire to lanka when he leaves uh, on his way back to sri rama and lanka burns down and ravana is in disgrace he is ashamed that this has happened he calls a conclave of all his generals and brothers and he tells them 
what a great disgrace has shame has fallen upon our race and kumbhakarnan ravana's brother who in valmiki ramayanam is a frightful giant in kamba ramayanam is actually a gentle giant kumbhakarnan tells ravana ravana you are talking of disgrace and shame what about the shame you brought us you brought another man's wife here and imprisoned her against her wishes you abducted her employing deceit you didn't go in your own form and ask her to come with you you went as a medicant you didn't fight with her husband and defeat him and bring her that would have been all right that is what we do that is what kings who conquer countries do you didn't do that you deceitfully brought her and imprisoned her and you're talking of shame what right do you have to talk of shame he doesn't listen and then vibhishana advises him vibhishana says goes one step beyond everybody else he says this is not vishnu anuman said this is vishnu vibhishana says this is not vishnu this is the one supreme god you think you have defeated the three gods i'm telling you this is one the one supreme power do not fight with him he banishes vibhishana and finally rama comes to fight with ravana the battle comes to lanka's shores and on the very first day of battle for no reason whatsoever ravana rushes into war he had no business on that battlefield there were many generals and soldiers who could do his job for him usually kings strategize they stay in the background and strategize they go when victory is imminent or when defeat is uh, apparent they don't usually rush into battle on the first day but ravana goes because he is clouded by his lust for sita he thinks these are two puny humans and a bunch of monkeys i can finish them off in no time and make sita my own so he goes with that intention and on that very first day of battle he is soundly beaten by rama and he rama makes him a nirayudan nirayudan means no weapons no ayudam so he is he has no weapons in his hands he has no crown on his head and he is standing before rama and to add insult to injury rama says indru poi porukku naalai va i will not fight with you you have no weapons in your hand go and come back tomorrow this sentence indru poi porukku naalai va is what makes rama rama but it is also a landmark point in ravana's life and kamban defines that point with a very very beautiful poem he says varanam puruda marbum varaina edutha tholum narada munivar kerpa nayambana uraitha naavum daradi mauli pattum sangaran kodutha vaalum veeramum kalathe pottu verungaiye ilangai pukka ravana lost everything that day his chest carried the tusks of elephants they were symbols of victory once upon a time when ravana had conquered all the gods there was nobody left to vanquish so he looked around for somebody to fight with and he found these huge eight elephants which were bearing the earth on their shoulders this is a puranic uh, belief that this earth was born on the on the shoulders of eight elephants so he found those elephants and uh, fought with those eight elephants defeated them but those elephants tusks pierced his chest and broke off and he carried those tusks on his uh, chest as a symbol of victory but subsequently after he met sita he fell three times at her feet he actually fell at her feet and begged her beseeched her to accept his passion so the symbol of victory had turned into a symbol of shame because it carried the dust of sita's feet that chest that magnificent chest carried the dust of sita's feet the 10 crowns in his head rolled off when he fell at the feet of sita and his shoulders ravana once lifted up the himalaya mountains with his shoulders and those shoulders were now drooping in shame because all the weapons are gone in all 20 arms ravana had a sword called the chandrahasan given to him by lord shiva with the battle after the battle with rama nobody knew where that sword went disappeared so ravana lost all of this and most of all kamban says he lost veeram he lost his valor after that first day of battle with rama he lost his valor and from that moment onwards ravana was a coward we saw him at the peak of tam uh, satvya of rajasam fell into the depths of tamasam he never went back to battle he sent his generals he sent kumbhakarnan he sent his sons adigayan and he sent his son indrajit and they all died but he never went back to battle with rama until the very end and then he went back to battle because of a woman not sita but a woman who was just like sita this epic kamban's epics has two heroines sita and mandodari ravana's wife mandodari is just as beautiful as sita just as virtuous as sita 
and loved her husband just as much as Sita did. So Mandodari uh, is faced with a huge tragedy. She loses all her sons and loses, it, loses them. Why? Because her husband, they went to protect her husband who was in love with another woman. Won't say, I shouldn't say love. She lusted. He lusted for another woman. So Mandodari lost her sons because of that. And the death of Indrajit was particularly cruel. This is where Kamban differs, differs from Valmiki's Ramayanam. In uh, Kamba Ramayanam, Indrajitan is decapitated. And the head is taken to Rama as a victory trophy. And Ravana brings the headless body of Indrajitan to Lanka. So Mandodri's first reaction when she sees the body is, where is my son's face? He is the one who vanquished the gods. Where is my son's face? She can't see her son's face in front of her. So she recalls her memories of his childhood when he played with tigers, when he brought the moon down to the earth and played with the moon. And in, in those memories, she can see his face. And then she says to herself, how could my son be defeated? He was all powerful. And then she realizes the true reason. The true reason her son lies headless today is because of Sita. And her entire sorrow turns into fear. And she, at that moment, she looks at Ravana. And she says, Anjine, Anjine, Asida Yenu Mamudal, Seda Nanjinal, Nala Yelangai Vendan, Nitage Nandru. She says, I am afraid now that tomorrow Ravana will meet the same fate. Tomorrow Ravana will lie dead in the battlefield like my son today. Even at the moment of her son's death, she is concerned about Ravana's life. And this love actually defines her. And this love changes Ravana's mind. Up to that point, he didn't listen to anybody. He didn't listen to the wise counsel of anybody. But the moment Mandodari says this, that Sita is the sole reason why all this happened. And she says, Sita is, uh, you think Sita is Amudam. Amudam is the nectar of the gods, but she's actually Nanja, she's poison. To us, she's poison. And Mandodari says, this is the reason all this happened. Ravana draws out his sword and rushes off to kill Sita. At that moment, that lust disappears from his soul. And so he goes back into battle one last time with Rama. And in that battle, he is in attack mode and Rama is in defense mode. So he is using all the weapons in his arsenal, one after the other. Rama is not fighting back. Rama is merely defending. Because this is a different Ravana from the one who came on the first day. This is a valorous Ravana. This is a Ravana who has discovered his pride, who has given up his lust for another man's wife. This is a different Ravana. He is difficult, he's difficult to beat. So it's a huge, long, drawn-out battle. At the end of the battle, Ravana throws a spear at Rama. And that spear is a spear given by the gods, which cannot be stopped by anybody. Not even the gods can stop that spear. Rama knows this. The spear is coming to a hurtling towards him. And Rama is uh, motionless. He's stunned. He doesn't know what to do. And at the moment when the spear is about to pierce Rama's chest, a sound emanates from him, from the very depths of Rama's soul. He utters a sound, mm. it's a grunt. And in the vibrations of that sound, the spear breaks into a thousand pieces. This is the only time in the entire epic when Rama shows that he is divine. Although Kamban's epic is called Ramavataram. Divinity is implied in the very title of Kamban's epic, Ramavataram. It's not Kambaramayana. We call it Kambaramayana. It's actually called Ramavataram. It means Rama is an avatar of Purushan. So the divinity of Rama is implied in the very title. And from then on, at every, every chance he gets, Kamban implies Rama's divinity. He makes him stand apart from everybody else. Valmiki is different. Ramayana means the journey of a man, journey of Rama. There, divinity is not implied. In the course of his journey, he rises to godhood. But he is not God descended to earth. Kamban, although he implies that Rama is an avadara purushan, Rama never shows at any moment in the epic that he is actually God. There are subtle references to it, but he, this is the moment when Ravana's spear comes to attack him. He emanates his grunt and the spear breaks into a thousand pieces and Ravana is shocked. He can't understand this power. He has seen the three gods, defeated the three gods, but this power is beyond, over and beyond. And he says, Sivano, Allan, Nanmugan, Allan, Tirmalam, Ivano, Allan, Meivaramillam, Adagindran, Tavano, Yenin, Seidamudikkum, Taranallan. 
இவனோ அவ்வேத முதல் காரணன் ஹீ இஸ் நாட் ஒன் ஆஃப் த த்ரீ காட்ஸ் இஸ் ஈ த காட் த ஒன் சுப்ரீம் காட் த த வேதாஸ் டாக் அபவுட் and so ravana is now confronted for the first time in his life with a superior power that he cannot defeat he knows he cannot defeat that power nobody can defeat the one supreme power so ravana has a choice two choices he can either surrender to that supreme power and let go of sita if he had done that he would have got moksha rama would have given him moksha the ramayana epic is a, is a story of sharanagati and rama says to uh, Sita, uh, Rama says to um, Sugriva that if somebody comes to me and asks for Saranagadi, for s- surrenders to me, I will give them Saranagadi. Even if they have killed my mother, my father or abducted my wife, he says I will give them Saranagadi. So Lakshmana turns to Rama and says, if you are going to give Saranagadi to Ravana, you remember you have crowned Vibhishana as the king of Lanka. you are going to give saranagadi to ravana which kingdom will you give ravana and in valmiki ramayana rama says i'll give him ayodhya okay that is maryada purushottam ram okay in it's not that part doesn't is not there in kamvans ramayana but in valmiki ramayana he says so what if vibhishana is going to uh, uh, rule lanka i'll give him ayodhya that's a big empire let ravana take ayodhya imagine that ravana as king of ayodhya rama could imagine it because he was he rose above and beyond all of us so uh, ravana had this choice to surrender to rama but then at that moment ravana is a soldier a veeran a valorous soldier more than anything else and he says yarenum dan aguga yan en thani aanmai pere i am a soldier and i will not give up my bravery and my valor i will fight with this person in front of me even if he is the one supreme god because it's my duty as a soldier to do so and so ravana goes into this battle where he knows he's going to die and he's killed by rama and at the very end kamban looks at ravana's body lying in the battle field and kamban says look at him he points him out to us and says look at him he's suffused with a satvik glow it might seem like a bit of an overreach to you how can ravana be suffused with satvik with a satvik glow Kamban says that's all that remains when rajasam and tamasam are gone he's like one of us he had all the three gunas he had satvikam and him, him too rama's arrow took away the rajasam and the tamasam and it's a very beautiful song he says vemmadangal vegundanaya sinamadanga manamadanga vinayam viya he says ravana's anger was like that of a roaring lion that anger is now gone the mind from which that anger arose that mind is gone the mind which gave rise to cunning that cunning is gone so all the uh, rajasik qualities are gone temmadangal perutadakkai seyaladanga mayaladanga aatralte the arms of ravana which were used to vanquish devotees those arms have become lifeless so rajasam is gone effort uh, uh, battle the, the ability to wield a sword the ability to fight all of that is gone so all the rajasik qualities are gone mayal kamam that's also gone that's a tamasic quality so rajasam and tamasam are gone all that remains is satvikam and once upon a time ravana was so full of satvikam he was he was uh, he did penance for 10000 years and every 1000 years he would emerge from his penance and cut off one of his heads and cut off one of his arms and throw it into the havan which he had raised for brahma the 10th time he was about to sacrifice his 10th head brahma appeared before him and gave him boon so at that time ravana had more satvikam than even the greatest of ascetics and rishis so once upon a time he was satvik and now that rajasam and tamasam were gone all that was left of ravana was satvikam and this is how kamban brings ravana very close to us maryada purushottam ram is an ideal it's a lofty ideal we have to reach up to him but it's very hard ravana is much more easy to identify with because kamban's ravana is like one of us a mixture of rajasam tamasam and satvikam and finally coming to mandodari after ravana is dead she comes to the battlefield 
she sees his body she falls on his chest and begins to weep she sees his body his body is like a sieve so many holes created by rama's arrows wherever rama's arrow pierced there was a hole and blood is gushing out and she looks at that body and says look at my husband's tirumeni tirumeni is a term used for the body of god divine form that's what tirumeni means how can ravana's be a dif- divine form she gives a perfectly rational explanation for it she says rama's arrow pierced his body in so many places rama's arrow is godly it knows where life resides that life resides in the heart and if you pierce that one place you can remove uh, life and the body will fall rama's arrow knows that it's a godly arrow and yet rama's arrow pierced his body in so many places why because rama's arrow's goal was not to remove the life but to remove the kamam for sita which existed all over ravana and rama's arrow didn't pierce my husband's body she can't even think of rama's arrow piercing her husband's body she says this is the body on which i used to rest my head rama's body i uh, ravana's body is no it's not pierced by the arrow the arrow gently removed the kamam from ravana's body like you remove butter from a dish and she says it so beautifully she says vellarkum sadai mudiyan verpedutta tirumeni melum keelum ellirkum idaminri uyirkum idam naadi ilaithavaro kallirkum malar koondal janagiyai manachirayil karanda kaadal ullirkum enakkaradi udal pugundu tadaviyado oruvan vaani you know what tadavudu means right and she says kallirkum malar koondal janagi most women have flowers in their hair and those flowers have honey her the hair uh, the flowers in her hair had kall had alcohol she had a, a magnetic quality to her beauty so my husband fell for her is that my husband's fault and she says this is his tirumeni which now belongs only to me because the desire for another woman has been eliminated from the tirumeni thank god for rama's bala you know and at this point you have to ask yourself what is the ramayana it means different things to different people okay the ramayanam is uh, exists in the very ethos of our culture it represents our value systems our spirituality our traditions it's many things to many of us it is ingrained in our soul it's ingrained in our soil it's a, a epic of bhakti and spirituality but more than anything else it is a lesson in life ravana teaches you that we are all the same all of us governed by the three gunas so who is an enemy and who is a friend the, this is the essence of the philosophy of vasudeva kudumbakam who is an enemy and who is a friend we are all governed by the three gunas it's an interplay of the three gunas that makes us do what we do none of us are good or bad and mandodari teaches you that it is possible to maintain your dignity even under the most adverse of circumstances you could ask is it practical is that possible what choice did she have ramana had another wife called danyamalai she also loses a son adhigayendra danyamalai berates ravana abuses him verbally mandodari could have done the same thing she could have despised ravana nobody would have blamed her but she would have lost her dignity in doing so she chose to to love what should not be loved she chose to do that because she wanted to maintain her dignity because it's a dignity that defines our life in the end that dignity of life endures long after life is extinguished that's something that women these days have to appreciate again the ramayana is a story of very very powerful women you would think that rama is the hero of the story not really sita is the hero of the story because when anuman at one point tells her in lanka he says i can't bear your sorrow i can't bear to leave you here come sit on my shoulders i'll take you with me and he refers to her as amma from the moment he sees her the d- relationship is defined mother and son but she says to him don't be worried about me she says not just this lanka all of creation i can burn down with one word of mine allal maakkal ilangeyadu aagumo ellai neetha ulagangal yavayum en sollinal suduven my one word if i say let lanka burn lanka will burn 
the reason i am not doing it is thuyavan villin villukku maasu ena i am not doing it because if i say that it will defile rama's bow and arrow it will defile his status as my husband he has to come and conquer he has to come and save me it's for his sake that i am keeping quiet so you see at that moment sita becomes even more powerful than rama rama had to fight for 10 days with so many weapons with a huge army he had to battle ravana all that sita needed was one word and yet she didn't do it and uh, then we come to tara tara is vali's wife tara is a, a totally different character from valmiki ramayana tara is widowed tara is grieving for vali and uh, sugrivan has forgotten his promise to vali uh, to rama sugrivan is lying in an inebriated state he is drunk he's forgotten to take the vanara army to rama and lakshmana comes demanding uh, uh, vengeance he, he wants to punish sugriva for having forgotten to help rama and anuman very cleverly sends tara in front of uh, lakshmanan and she is dressed in widow's attire and the moment he sees her he remembers his mothers back in ayodhya who must be wearing the same white and the first sentence she says to him is magane she calls him son how fortunate is my house that you have chosen to step exactly what his mothers would have told him so tara knows what to say when so she is another heroine sumitra who says only two sentences to lakshmana lakshmana goes to tell her that i am going with rama to the forest she says go don't come back she says go don't come back if rama is not coming back die before rama i order you not to outlive your brother the second thing she says is go not as a brother go as his servant in the forest serve him and so lakshmana takes that word to heart and doesn't sleep for 14 years and guards rama so that is sumitra kausalya when uh, rama goes to say that today i am not being crowned king no pattabhishegam for me today varadan is becoming king she says nirai gunattavan ninninum nallan he is an excellent boy in fact he is better than you but in our uh, uh, the rule in our race is that the oldest son must ascend the throne so the rule is being broken but he is a better fit to be king than you so that is kausalya and when in the very end of the epic varada tells rama i will wait for you for 14 years one day beyond 14 years if you are late i will burn myself in the fire so rama is delayed in bharadwaja sashram and so anuman comes to meet varada to tell him what had happened before anuman reaches varada prepares a pyre he tells his brother shatrugna you become king i'm going to fall into the fire and kill myself and shatrugna says my older brother didn't want this kingdom he walked away my younger brother wanted to help my older brother he walked away now you're going to die in the fire am i a fool to become a king i don't want this kingdom but at that time kausalya comes and says don't uh, kill yourself because you are worth 1 crore ramas not just 1 crore ramas ennil kodi ramargal you are equal to countless ramas this is rama's mother telling kaikeyisa and she says if you die this whole world will come to an end don't do it my son so these are the women in ramayanam and mandodari just three scenes in those three scenes kamban makes her a heroine and is it possible for is this characterization true is this real is this possible it is because only women can rise up to that high a standard of dignity and only women have that sense of occasion women have that sense of purpose it's very difficult for men to maintain dignity at all times it's very easy for women to do what men can't do because basically they have it in them to they have that inordinate power to love they have that inordinate power to sacrifice to give they are used to doing it they are used to childbirth the pangs of childbirth going through all that pain for somebody else so women can rise far above men and kambans ramayanam depicts it like no other 
And in the very, very end, Rama's arrows vanquished so many enemies. But the sharpest arrow is reserved for Sita. When she uh, is brought to the battle, it's all a misunderstanding. Rama tells Vibhishana, bring Sita to the battlefield with the respect that is owed to her. That's all he says. Vibhishana dresses her up as a queen and brings her to the battlefield. Vibhishana has a vested interest. His brother imprisoned uh, Sita and for 14 years she had developed the, you know, the uh, Jadamudi like that of uh, Sanyasi and she had not had a bath and she looked weak and Kamban says she looked like a faded moon, like a moon that rises in the day. You see the moon in the morning sky, it's faded, that's how Sita looked. She was bright as a moon as night, at night, looked like a faded moon. So Vibhishana doesn't want Rama to see her like that. So Vibhishana makes her bathe and dress and adorns her and brings her like a queen to the battlefield. Rama sees her. He takes one look at her and he starts abusing her verbally. He says, why have you come here now? Have you come here now to gloat over the fact that I have come to uh, rescue you? After having lived in the prison, in the harem, in the palace of this Asura king, having lived with... Uh, you know, living the best of life, enjoying the best of luxuries, the best of food. Have you come to serve that food to me now? Have you come now to show off how your life has been? I have been living in a forest all this while and you've been living a life of luxury. And Rama takes off on Sita and speaks the unspeakable words and finally he says, go, die. Podi Sadi. That's all he says. And he stops. Sita calls Lakshmana and says, create the pyre, I'm going to sacrifice myself to the fire. In that place, you must imagine this battles, battlefield, Vibhishana is there, Anuman is there, Sugriva is there, all the Vanaras are there, the entire Vanara battalion is there, Lakshmana is also there somewhere, but Sita calls him and asks him to light the pyre. Why? Because long ago, Sita burnt him with her tongue. When Lakshmana refused to go to go to go and capture Mar to help Rama when he was fighting with Marichan, the Marichan screams Rama's name as he is dying, and Lakshmana uh, thinks it is Rama's voice, and Sita thinks not Lakshmana. Sita thinks it's Rama's voice, and Sita wants to go. Sita wants uh, Lakshmana to go and save Rama. Lakshmana says, "I won't go." You don't know who your husband is. I know who he is. He is not being he is not capable of being defeated by anybody. I will not go. And then she says, Nindra nin nila yidhi neriyatrandru. You are standing here when my husband is fighting for his life, which means your intentions towards me are wrong. This is to a boy who was told by his mother. Hereafter, there's another thing that uh, Sumitra says. She says, Rama is Dasharata. Sita is the queen, the three queens. She is your mother. Rama is your father. And that's how he behaved. That's how he uh, venerated them. And she says this to Lakshmana. And Lakshmana is not able to bear it anymore. And he goes. And she says at that time, there is a forest fire not far from here. If you don't go, I'll throw myself into the fire and burn myself up. So uh, she says these hurtful words to him. Although Lakshmana didn't say this to Rama, there's a lot of wordless communication between the brothers. That's what happens when there is true understanding and love. When Marichan is killed and Rama is coming and Lakshmana is going to see him, Rama immediately understands from Lakshmana's eyes that he has been hurt. He knows that Lakshmana came, is coming here only because Sita has chased him off with some harsh words. Although Sita, Lakshmana never reveals what those harsh words are, Rama knows. And when he first sees Sita, his first reaction is to seek revenge for the harsh words that Sita said. And Sita understands it. Sita understands that Rama is seeking revenge. And she wants to show Rama that, yes, I understand what you're doing. So I will burn myself in the same fire in which I threatened to fall, you know, and purify this tongue with which I uttered bad words to Lakshmana. So Kamban says, Kannin no kina. He says, all this communication happened just by glances. Lakshmana looks at Rama's face, you know, asking wordlessly, what should I do? Rama, with his eyes, gives assent, gives consent. Because 
Rama knows why Sita is doing the Agni Parichai. Rama did not say do the Agni Parichai. Rama said Podi Sadi, go and die. He did not define how, where, what. She chose this Agni Parichai because she wanted to show her husband that she understood why he was subjecting her to this. You see, she had to live a very long life with him. This can't be a misunderstanding between husband and wife. That whole fabric of the marriage is destroyed. And so she does this to show her husband that she understands. So you see, it's more than a story of just gods and goddesses and mythology. It's a story about life. It's a story about what we should be and a story about what we can be. And I leave you with these thoughts. <laughs>